So yes, much narrower focus than the previous presentations. Uh, I'm so glad I can give it here and very happy to be here uh, as a French working in Switzerland, following a Swiss working in France, to complement each other. Um, so I think the, this, this presentation follows up a bit with this morning's panel too on, on populism in a way, but this time looking a bit more at the, the supply side. So I, I, it's a focus on the, the, the Front National in 2017 and trying to give a, a bit of a historical perspective and how it evolved and how it got there to the second round in 2017 and uh, sort of a description of how the FN get there and where it stands now. Um, so I'll give you a bit of the, the context specifically on the, on the Front National and not about the, the general election. Talk briefly about the transformation of its constituency, uh, but then go look into supply sides uh, um, aspects, which will be one, the professionalization, institutionalization of the party, which has really changed dramatically look into elements of the campaign strategy of 2017, and then ask a bit this question of a, that I call an electoral impasse uh, to see if the, the, the FN has maybe hit a strategic uh, deadlock and, a, and an electoral ceiling. So as for the, the context, the FN broke all records in the 2017 presidential election, 21% in the first round, that's 7.6 million votes, and almost 34% in the, in, the, in the second round. Um, I want to point out that this is at the same time an unprecedented success for the FN. It's a record election for them, and yet also a bit of a failure. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you why in different, different elements. First, there was a very, very favorable context for the Front National in this election. All the, the issues, uh, the prominent issues leading up to the election sort of created a favorable contact, context for, uh, for the Front National, the migration crisis, Brexit, Trump terrorist attacks, and I add maybe political elite corruption, although it's, it's a bit harder to say since the Front National and Marine Le Pen herself were involved in some of these scandals, they didn't play this card uh, uh, as much as they could have. But over the, 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 the two for three years leading to the 2017 election, Marine Le Pen has been claiming everywhere that the Front National was France's first party. Uh, indeed, in the, the three intermediate elections leading to, um, to the 2017 presidential election, uh, the Front National is ranked first. Uh, so this is in terms of uh, individual party, not coalitions, but as individual party between 25 and 20, almost 28 percent in every uh, local elections. Also in the, poll leading to the, the polls leading to the election, uh, Marine Le Pen ranked first for uh, about a year before the election, always ranking to between 22 and, and 29%. Um, however, I show you here a, a, a short graph of, the, of these uh, trends, which was actually made by Romain, uh, which what it shows is that um, Never in a, in a French presidential campaign had the, the lines crossed so much, except for Marine Le Pen, where she's more or less stable and on top, except at the end, but stable and on top for, the, for the, almost the entire campaign, whereas all other candidates' polling trains are, are uh, crossing, and basically none of the candidates uh, attained the position they were expected to in January. It all shifted, uh, but the more stable one is still uh, Marine Le Pen. I think a good example of how this uh, election was a sort of a, of a critical election for the FN as a, a record and a failure is the legislative elections which followed the, the presidential election one month after, which is a good example of this ambivalent success because in the legislative elections they only got 13.3% of the votes. So it's an election that is usually uh, uh, less uh, favorable to the, to the FN uh, with local uh, single member districts and they gain only eight seats. So it is a failure for France's first claimed first party, yet it's also a record for the Front National, uh, except for the one, one uh, election in the 80s where there were, was proportional representation, never had the FN achieved to have eight seats in parliament. So uh, in, in this paper, I'll then now focus a bit on the supply side and try to see uh, a bit how Marine Le Pen strategically shifted the, the, the Front National and, um, and how in 2017 uh, 
this election probably has sensible uh, consequences for the party. Uh, and I call this maybe a strategic deadlock. Uh, I think it's a strategy that worked, so maybe not a deadlock, because it did allow the Front National to uh, attain record, uh, record electoral successes but maybe an electoral impasse because uh, they seem to be a bit uh, stuck and not be able to, uh, to go, over the, go over a majority of, of votes. So the rest of this presentation, I briefly show you trends of transformation of the FN's uh, constituency, and then how, uh, talk a bit about how the party transformed in terms of uh, organization, and then really look into the political offer, uh, how the party shifted its position uh, to, I think, adapt to uh, its increasingly working class constituents, to the losers of globalization. So I think there will be a, a bit of discussion with uh, what Martial showed. And finally, conclude on this idea of, uh, of electoral impasse. Transformation of the FN, so this is a long story, the transformation of the FN constituency, and I just here listed a few of these, uh, of the terms that have been used, uh, so popular electorate, uh, the second uh, Le Pen vote, as opposed to a more traditional uh, radical right vote, uh, working class uh, Le Penism, or left-wing uh, Le Penism, so it's a, it's a long, the long study story is already starting in the 90s, although I think we can observe uh, more dramatic shifts uh, to this regard in recent elections. And here I use uh, post-electoral studies, mostly uh, from the, the CEDIPOF and the CEE, um, to show this. This is, I'll just show one graph about the, the transformation of the constituencies, um, which I think can contrast maybe a few of the things we, we talked about this morning. Um, so here's the occupational distribution of, a, of a, so vote according to occupation. Um, the small dotted line on top are the blue workers, the blue collar workers, and there's an increase of the working class vote for the FN uh, in every election. They reach 35 percent uh, in, in 2017, and also the gap between the working class vote and the regular vote, the overall vote for the Front National, is increasing uh, every year. So that's only descriptive, but it is an indication that there is a, 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 some sort of occupational class effect. And Marcelli said earlier, the FN is not the party of the poor voters, not the party, but more the party of the unhappy voters. Yeah. Income, maybe not so much. Then you say, you conclude there's not social class. Income, probably not so much. Occupation, there's an effect. So here it's only descriptive, but then if you kind of run these models with the uh, occupational status, you see that being a working class, blue collar worker, always has a very strong impact on voting for the Front National. Just one other um, element I mentioned, which is not in the graph, is the, the farmer's vote. I thought I had to mention it because it increased dramatically uh, in 2017, where Marine Le Pen got almost a quarter of the, the, the farmer rural vote, which she did not earlier. So she really uh, managed to get increased uh, in this limited but politically important segment of the, of the population. I could add something, yeah, educational gap. Uh, it's also increasing over time, so the lower educated tend to vote much more for the Front National than the higher educated, and this gap is increasing over time. Um, however, it's not to say that the most lower educated individuals vote for the Front National. They tend not to vote, and this is a bit of the same. The Front National has been claiming it's become the party of the working class, and it hasn't. The abstention is still the most favored party of the working class, but certainly it's increasingly a working class party. And this argument that it's increasingly a working class party uh, is kind of the root of, of the programmatic shift that the FN has, uh, has undergone, uh, which already uh, this morning also on Speta you mentioned, the radical right parties will shift a bit on, on economic issues to adapt to their uh, constituents. Uh, so before going into the description of this shift, I'll briefly say something, but it's quite important for the Front National about the organization of the party itself, which has radically transformed since Marine Le Pen um, uh, took power, took the party in, in 2011. It has uh, certainly more modernized, uh, it's more structured, it has uh, much more, 
activists that are involved, integrated. It forms now as a highly uh, efficient uh, formation for their candidates. And in general, it has normalized from a uh, one-man organization to a woman-led, more conventional uh, party, uh, which can build now on the local power base of these previous electoral results that I uh, mentioned uh, earlier in 2014-2015. Uh, the party, the Front National, now has a power base which it did not ever have before. Uh, so it has a record numbers of, uh, of council seats, record numbers of, of councillors in the different uh, local assemblies, which it never managed to, to attain before. So I think de-demonization of the party is a term that now has, uh, has, uh, has been taken up by Marine Le Pen herself, as it was uh, critically uh, mentioned before that they are trying to de-demonize the party. She actually claimed this political rupture. So, since I have little time, I go straight into the campaign strategy, uh, saying the party of Front National is not a, a single issue party anymore. Uh, I here uh, rely mostly on, on salience uh, analysis, so, so salience data, so from manifestos and then from the collection of tweets that we did during the, the campaign um, to see the substantial transformations of the, of the agenda. And first, I take a look because the argument is that they have shifted on economic issues. Are, we can also say there's a bit of difference on the social cultural issues. Uh, and uh, looking at uh, the manifesto, the 2017 manifesto, uh, the, these items coded as law and order and national way of life, so really an opposition to uh, multiculturalism, make up for more than 25% of the, of the entire FN manifesto. Um, However, there is a bit of evolution, uh, particularly on this traditional morality indicator, which used to be a very prominent uh, um, a salient issue for the Front National, which is really uh, not anymore. And that this was really illustrated by Marine Le Pen's lack of involvement in the gay marriage, for instance, uh, debate. Um, in terms of economic issues, the FN also has strongly changed. The big change we saw, the black line which is going uh, decreasing is uh, from salience of market economy which has almost decreased, so in 2017 the Front National is almost not promoting market economy in any way, uh, whereas planned economy or, or uh, welfare expansions are highly uh, increasing indicators. However, there is a, a little change between 2012 and 2017. So we can see the influence of Marine Le Pen being the candidate in 2012, radical change of the economic uh, um, preferences, but there is already a change in 2017 where these more left-wing uh, economic uh, preferences are uh, declining. So this might be a sign that 2012 was a very specific election during the crisis, but then when we kind of go out of the crisis, the FN might come back to its original, um, original agenda, uh, giving less uh, significance to uh, socio-economic issues. Briefly, we collected all the tweets during the campaign. Um, so because as it was mentioned earlier, it's also more dynamic uh, and, uh, uh, than manifesto data, and you can perceive a bit more how the, the campaign evolves. Uh, and this four, I just listed the four top tweets, which make up for 70% of Marine Le Pen uh, online campaign. Uh, and the first two are, of course, cultural, fighting terrorism, and reduce immigration. And it's important to note that fighting terrorism for Marine Le Pen is very much linked to immigration. She links it to, uh, to immigration uh, very consistently to opening borders and Islam. So the first two are very much uh, giving this not single, single issue party, but dominantly cultural and, and uh, immigration oriented party. But there's also a social line, an address to the losers of globalization uh, and uh, limiting economic globalization. I will skip and go straight to my conclusion. Um, so there is um, professionalization of the party, but it's still ongoing. During the campaign we saw it, the, the second round debate has been uh, called for once uh, uh, significant and had an effect showing actually that the party was not ready. Uh, there is uh, also this blurred position on the EU and the Euro, which 
usually uh, we, the argument is that the, the radical right parties have blurred position on social economic issues not to, uh, to antagonize either their more left-wing oriented voters or right-wing, but this one probably was not an asset because they had blurred positions which they actually could not uh, determine clearly. And a uh, tribune isolation, so they, uh, the campaign boiled down a bit to a populist, uh, just a populist anti-elite. Uh, um, modernization is actually on its way. There is the Congress of the Front National is actually starting after tomorrow, so we will know a bit more by then, uh, particularly on, on the, the, the political preferences and this, to know if this left-wing economic shift has actually hit the electoral glass ceiling for the, for the Front National. Marine Le Pen was called by Fillon a radical leftist. And uh, if you look at the voice, the, the, the gains in the second round, she did not gain as many as expected votes from the right, but also not so much from the left, despite very strong efforts and a direct address to, to Mélenchon's voters. So this question of these different winning formulas of getting the conservative right, cultural conservative right, and, and, um, and some working class vote is, might be a, a, a losing equation, now, I don't want to speculate about the possible orientations the party will take, uh, which is something you say when you're about to speculate, but it's quite unlikely, I would say, that the leadership of Marine Le Pen is contested, but it's quite likely that the party will redefine its strategy to the right on economic uh, issues with potentially uh, this, this possibility of unifying the, the, the rights as the Republicans themselves has moved uh, into a different direction. And I stop there to remain on time. Thank you.